hello everyone and thank you for joining us today welcome to through her lens conversations on reframing the domestic just a few introductions before we begin today zuban is a feminist publishing house and ngo that chronicles and participates in women's movements in india and south asia we are conducting this webinar as part of zuban and the sasakawa peace foundation's fragrance of peace project which aims to broaden the scope of research and literary work in the northeastern states of india by strengthening existing networks building new partnerships and facilitating cultural exchange this particular webinar series runs in parallel to the online photo exhibition through her lens reframing the domestic which is curated by mridu rai and anusha pradhan submissions are open and the guidelines are up on our website and we'll just be putting the link in the chat box shortly i'm karuna from zuban and i will be hosting the discussion today this is the first webinar in our series of conversations that hopes to engage with the issues of present challenges the lockdown the collapse of the public and the private sphere the merging of paid unpaid work etc and to see how all of this is affecting marginalized communities particularly in the northeast this series also aims to look at the element of visual research and photography and what archiving in a covid and post covid world means especially now that the boundaries between the storyteller and the photographer the documentarian and the story itself have collapsed the topic of today's webinar is ethics and consent in photography and the issues and challenges that arise when capturing private lives and intimate settings today we will be speaking uh, we will be joined by dolly kikon mansi tapliyal and bunu dumbana who will be speaking about the issues and challenges involved in the documentation of private lives of women and marginalized communities and the role and importance of consent and ethics i'll just briefly introduce our speakers for today in the order that they're going to be speaking they will each be speaking for 10 minutes following which they'll accept questions Mansi Tapliyal was born and raised in Rishikesh and has worked with Reuters as a photojournalist covering important news events and working on stories highlighting gender related issues. Her long term projects tend to capture the nuances of intimate spaces inhabited by the women around her. Her works have been published in the New York Times, Time Magazine, Wall Street Journal and various other reputed publications. Dr Dolly Kikon is an anthropologist teaching at the University of Melbourne and a senior research associate at the Australia India Institute Melbourne. Her work focuses on the political economy of extractive resources, migration, development initiatives, gender relations, food cultures and human rights in India. Bunu Dungana discovered photography after leaving the world of academia and research, but her background in sociology informs her work. A graduate of JNU Delhi, she is interested in questioning notions of gender and patriarchy. While she focuses on personal projects that center around women's issues, she has worked within a wide range, be it visual ethnography, NGO work, or commercial work. She loves roaming about places, people watching, and eavesdropping. She lives and works in Kathmandu, Nepal, and is currently working with the Nepal Picture Library. Before we begin, I would just like to go over the rules for the participants today. Thank you all for joining us here. your video and audio would have automatically been turned off on entry and please do continue to keep them turned off questions will be taken via the chat box which we will close once we get a certain number of questions that can be answered today however if there are any remaining questions you can direct them to the speaker speakers after the webinar is over the raise hand function is still available to direct any queries at the host that is me and anyone else who has zuban/thl in their names We will start dealing with the audience questions after all three speakers have finished speaking. If there's any speaker in particular that you want to direct your question to, please make sure you mention that as well. This discussion will be recorded and posted online on our social media channels. While the list of participants won't be available, if you choose to ask a question or speak, your name might be displayed. Entry has been moderated to guard against trolling and no hate speech targeting or discriminating against any community will be tolerated. Any participants using such language will be removed from the webinar immediately without warning. As far as posting or quoting any of our speakers today on social media outside this webinar is concerned, you are free to do so. And uh, Mansi, you can begin now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining in today. So um, I'm going to start. 
I mean, I was I was not sure like what I'm going to talk about when it comes to ethics and consent. So, but um, this one uh, this one project I would like to go back to is is don't call me auntie. Is the time when I used to uh, live in the back lanes of Bengali market between 2008 and 2013, and uh, and it was I shifted there even before. I I photographic I I mean took, took camera so maybe I can maybe I can start sharing sorry I've never done this thing online so uh, okay so yeah can everybody see my screen now yes yeah okay so I will start with this project which is don't call me auntie it is uh, the time I had. Uh, documented uh, my uh, when I was living with my landlady and uh, and this is an old edit and the reason I wanted to bring old edit is also uh, and because somehow I don't feel connected to it I feel that uh, the way I feel for the place for the um, the memories of auntie that edit edit keeps changing accordingly and uh, somehow there are some images i i can see that i reveal more about myself than uh, than auntie or uh, any other so if i can first read oh wait 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 how does this work yeah But now it's not working. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So maybe I can put it on slide. So with the, I started, I. And this is also the time when I picked up photography. I bought my first camera. So I was shooting mostly. Yeah, I was shooting mostly. Uh, wait, wait. Sorry, wait. Yeah, so I was mostly shooting, not being conscious of exactly what are, I mean, where I was just kind of archiving. I was putting these images in my folder. And it's a huge work. It's almost 40 folders. And uh, it's only in 2013 that I, I somebody, uh, a friend of mine, he said, oh, show me your pictures and what's happening other than what you shoot for Reuters and things. So I, I just flipped. I showed him these photographs and he just pointed out. I. Mansi, I think there's something happening there. And uh, but at the same time, talking about consent, uh, because for a very long time, it wasn't in my mind that what I'm going to do with these images and what these images are actually doing. So, uh, and also, in some places, if you see, like, for instance, this image I, I want to bring uh, uh, your attention to, which I feel like uh, it's not, it now reveals more about myself. Like, I, this is the image which I had taken, was very, uh, almost in 2009 and 10, and I now I feel that, why is it even there in the edit? I mean, it's there because I feel it, it reveals more about myself, my own uh, being a little a warrior and being curious and uh, yeah, so. But, but at the same time, it wasn't like I was carrying my camera all the time. It was, you know, I would see something and I would rush to and take a picture and, you know, and just keep the camera away. And uh, 
and then slowly slowly everything came together uh and at the same time i felt that there was a risk uh i was taking constantly because uh there was toys when auntie asked me to leave so uh so i i don't know i think it was a constant process of sensing what how uh, how the people how auntie and uh, kamlesh and other characters in the house i mean uh so there was auntie who was my landlady and then there was uh, kamlesh who was a living maid and her three daughters so they all were living together and me i was staying as a paying uh, paying guest as a tenant so uh so there was also i was at risk because i didn't wanted to leave that locality it was very central for me very easy the rent was cheaper so i was constantly sensing that what is the boundary i can cross and what i cannot and uh, yeah and i think that's why there is some one can also see some distance in the process and uh, yeah and i think a uh, lot of images were also made out of uh, fear i i feel that was fear that i was not i was not able to approach her i was i was staying away i was distant from her and uh, and that's why some of the frames are like that and it's slowly later on which is not here in the edit that or maybe this frame i can say that where i feel that i i got to know uh, auntie more closely um or maybe not I, so yeah and hmm so yeah that's it i uh, and then i can show and then after in 2013 um i had to leave the house because auntie passed away and uh, then i moved back to rishikesh with my father and uh, that's when i started also started photographing my father and uh, and my house and i feel and that also i felt that every time um, the ca the camera becomes this tool to uh to make a connection uh to to be a to able to see the other person which i feel sometimes uh i i as a person i lack to see the other and uh, so yeah so so this is one of the image of my little brother who was crying in acting um so a friend of mine asked that uh, why did you take a picture of a uh, your cuz uh, your your brother crying but then i know that there was something after the image happened and before that and i the reason i took that picture because it was a funny moment for me uh, i could see that he he is just doing what i i mean i used to do it as as a child you know you are you're angry or upset and you you pretend crying you were really not and i remember when i took this picture and in the next moment he looked at me he started to laugh um and this is another image of my father and uh, yeah i think that uh camera is also a way for me to feel connected to him the things which i cannot uh probably say to him yeah and i think rest i can take up in questions i this is sorry i have never done this before uh yeah i, I karuna is it uh, yeah sure. uh thank you mansi uh dolly you're next i'm sorry it's <laughs> um 
Thank you, Mansi. I, I really enjoyed your pictures and I think um, your pictures speak to me a lot as an anthropologist. What we try to do is we try to write and capture what seems ordinary or mundane, but connect with deeper stories about societies and social relations um, and intimate lives. So I, I would like to thank Zuban for inviting me to this session. And I'm looking at the lovely poster, Reframing the Domestic Ethics and Consent in Photography. So the panel is about issues and challenges in capturing private lives and intimate settings. And right there, I think as a feminist anthropologist, and also having been in the, in the human rights movement in, in India, the domestic is always right, not, not the, not the domestic as we think. Uh, the, the, the blurring of the private and the public sphere has been very central in challenging uh, frameworks and foundations of uh, patriarchy. And, and then this then relates to actually the, the sub-theme of our conversation about how do we then capture private lives, right? The, the basis of the public and the private, if we have to blur it, how do we look at intimacy? Right? Whether it's the intimacy that we share as partners, as communities, the intimacy of the domestic, or even the intimacy of citizenship that we are going through. How do we locate this in conversations about frames? I feel that as, as a Naga anthropologist, I think the Nagas are one of the most photographed colo uh, in, in colonial India and most uh, captured subjects across since the 19th and the 20th century. And I would like to contextualize my experience with photography in that. Um, I, I flip through coffee books, you know, and now with the Hornbill and those amazing festivals that we have across the Northeast and the Eastern Himalayas, we are once again actually engaging with images in a very different way. When I think about photography, I think about two ways of looking at photography. The first is thinking about stillness, right? Capturing a stillness and what does it tell us? What do we freeze in that moment, both historically and politically? And the second one is visual. And how do we capture the visual? The visual for me as a writer and as an anthropologist is a form. If I have to deal with text and language, the visual and photography is a form that I'm constantly thinking about. This leads me then to contextualizing photography for a conversation through um, a kind of world making. So if I have to look at photography, both as a Naga anthropologist, as a feminist, as, as somebody engaging with the human rights movement in India, what kind of world making are we involved in as we take a camera and capture? And I think this is really, for me, a profound moment to be talking about this to, through the Zuban platform, because the 2020 um, Pulitzer Photography Award has gone to Indian citizens looking at Kashmir. And I think that needs to be contextualized. Out of the 14 photographs that's, that's um, shown to us on the net through the Pulitzer Prize website, what catches my attention is the gaze. And if we have to look at the gaze in anthropology, the gaze is something very strong. The gaze, the concept of the gaze and what we look at also reminds me of colonialism. And time and again, I bring that because if we have to look at who we photograph and the subjects, how do we make sense of ethics right there, right? If we are looking at the gaze and if you're looking at photography as world making then, perhaps for the viewer, they are receiving a world that you and I are offering them. And that means for the photographer, as professional photographers, as, as aesthetic photographers, or for me as an anthropologist who uses the camera in the field, what is that world that we are creating to offer to our community? perhaps a political community, perhaps uh, an aesthetic community, an artistic community. And that is then tied to the question of how much do we reveal through our photographs? What is it that we're connecting? Having laid out some of, I guess, my thoughts this evening, I would just like to focus on three things in my own experience that I have, in my very limited way, experiences that I have had with the camera. The first is about Photography as evidence. So when I finished my law school in 2000 and I joined the human rights uh, movement, we did a lot of fact findings across India, particularly Northeast India. 
And one of my first encounter with photographs were where photographs as evidence of bodies, right? whether they were bullet ridden bodies, where, whether they were tortured bodies, bodies that had endured violence and how do we see it? So in a sense for me then, photography very early on through the lens of human rights became a documentation of how is it that we capture domestic activities, not in the gendered way, but in perhaps in the human rights way, and then bringing the gender uh, lens to that. And in all these three examples that I will give first, in my human rights work in India, the photography as evidence has been really important. The second that I want to present to the uh, audience for conversation is my role as an anthropologist and how is it today that I look at a camera. I always think because my people have always been on the other side of the camera, being constantly objectified, being pushed and pulled, being ridiculed to wear certain clothes, being ridiculed to take off certain clothes. How is it then today if I have a camera in my hand, do I think about photography in itself? Very quickly, I think about, is it collaborative? Right? Or this photo that I'm taking is objectifying it? So these are some of the questions that I think about. And I'm a horrible photographer, let me tell you. Half of my photographs are rejected when I send it to journal articles because they say, oh, the resolution is not right, or oh, that is not right, or oh, this is not right. And so what I do is that I constantly use every form that's there because for me, a lens is a lens. So my research associates, my students, my colleagues always tell me, Jolly, you're always using terrible uh, cameras to take photographs. Because for me, it's the image. But perhaps for the journal article and for other magazines, it's also the resolution and other technicalities that come into being. So using a camera for me makes me a student over and over again. And I think that's a very humbling process. The third and the last point that I would like to share this evening thinking about photographs has to do with the Zuban project that I was part of five years ago. And it was the impunity project in South Asia where I think Lakshmi and a lot of amazing people, Gita and others, Urvashi, Uma Chakravarti, they all brought out the impunity series on South Asia. I think numerous volumes. And I was invited to be part of that. I ended up writing a chapter for the Zuban uh, volume, but I also ended up doing a separate ethnography called uh, Life and Dignity. One of the things that I encountered was horrendous stories of sexual violence in militarized societies in Nagaland. And I had a camera, but I did not have the courage to take portrait shots. Neither did I think that it was appropriate in any way to be taking photographs of survivors of sexual violence. But I needed to remember, because I remember when I leave the field as an anthropologist, I remember through photographs. Right? And I have a strange way of remembering the field, because the field can be both a location of power, it can be a site that you and I can see, the field can be a conversation that I've had with my friends, with my informants, with families around. And so, since I had a camera in my hand when I was doing uh, the ethnographic project for Zuban, and particularly for my book, uh, which turned out to be Life and Dignity, I remember that I ended up taking, and it surprised me. Perhaps it, it was a way of growing up for me because I ended up taking a lot of photographs which were actually out of context. So in a sense, in a rehabilitation home where I was interviewing uh, victim uh, survivors of sexual violence, I ended up taking a lot of pictures of the kitchen garden, right? the vegetables that they were growing, of the kitchen. The other picture that I started taking was staircase of the police station where you know the police would file for cases. So I didn't take shots of the police women or, or police personnel, but I took photos of the wall, of signs, of the curtain, of empty uh, alcohol bottles inside the women's police station. Because the, it was a sign for me to, to, 
to remind me how violent and how traumatized the women police themselves were as they were recording and documenting those cases of sexual violence. The third kind of photos that I remember taking, I still have it with me, are blurry ones, right? From the back, blurry hands, blurry feet, just like blurry, blurry, blurry body, body parts of women who were traumatized and were narrating their stories of violence. So these are all blurry, but in a sense, the blurriness still kind of shakes me because none of them, after they had encountered that kind of violence, could even sit still as they were telling the stories. The last photo that I remember and I still have are images of dolls. Because I remember very clearly when I was doing that field work that time for Zuban, it was around uh, International uh, Women's, Women's Rights Day, 8 March. And before that, I was interviewing some of the women survivors of sexual violence. And what they were doing where they were creating small dolls, right, which were keychains so that it would generate funds for the kind of rehabilitation, rehabilitation work that they were doing. So I focused a lot of my photographs then on the needles and the, and the yarn and the dolls that they were making. And for that reason, when I look at my photo from five years ago that I worked with Zuban, these photographs for me are, remind me of what sometimes can be out of context, are totally in context of what we are actually trying to um, connect and narrate. So perhaps I'll leave it to the audience and for discussions later on. But those are the stories that I wish to share. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dolly. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about my work uh, confrontations um, uh, with regard to this idea of uh, private, public. Uh, you know, my work uh, sort of uh, attempts to question what it means to be a woman in a very deeply patriarchal Hindu society. Uh, I, I also talk about ideas of body, menstruation, marriage, um, violence, all this with uh, regard to this larger structure called patriarchy. And now sort of, you know, when I look back at my work, and I think it is also sort of important to talk about the journey of the work. It's not that one day I suddenly got up and said, okay, let me do work on this. I think it's been on my mind for a very long period of time, you know, as far as uh, I can go back to my childhood when, you know, as a girl, I was constantly reminded that I'm a girl and I have to be a certain way, you know, I have to, uh, there's a way of laughing, there's a way of sitting, eating, dressing up. And, and I, even as a child, I, I, I never understood why. And, and these things, you know, these rules of do's and don'ts just started becoming even more prominent as I grew older. Uh, but yet, I think I was always sort of struggling to find the vocabulary or the language, uh, you know, to talk about uh, these experiences. But over the period of time, you know, whatever I've done, somehow has helped me shape uh, my work. And, and especially when I was in the university, you know, between 2004 to six, and uh, briefly in 2009, uh, you know, I was doing sociology and social sciences in a way somehow it felt that, you know, I could find my place in the world. And, you know, we were talking about society, we were talking about family, we were talking about gender. And I think it sort of helped me, uh, you know, give me a little bit of framework or a perspective uh, in life. And, uh, but yet it was still so much of a struggle for me to, you know, put that in my photography, because when I started uh, photography, it was more about sort of going out, you know, photography is also has this history of sort of you going out, you know, loitering in the street and taking pictures. And, um, you know, I, I love that uh, idea of it. Uh, but at the same time, as a lot of photographers would agree, you know, uh, there comes a point when we all try taking self portraits and, you know, we all try to point the camera inwards and try and see, you know, what we can do. So over the period of time, I've, um, I have been doing that. And now when I look back, in a way, the root of my work was sort of planted in 2012 when I did this series with a doll. And, you know, I was just sort of learning photography at that time and trying to understand what, what this medium is, what it can do. Uh, I think I'm still doing that. I feel I'm still learning and I'm still trying to understand uh, the medium. And... Uh, then there was this doll and then suddenly there were certain self-portraits I had taken of myself 
And there came a point around 2016 where I worked with somebody else, like a collaborative process, uh, you know, and even then I felt like I was putting more of myself in her, you know, than her story. So I felt maybe, you know, I should start telling my story. And uh, that's how sort of confrontation came into being, um, being the work that it has become. And it's still, I feel my work is still sort of uh, a a process, you know, a process to sort of understand the world around me. Uh, of course, it is about me, but at the same time, you know, it. I feel it's also about the society we uh, we live in. You know, how how being a woman uh, in, in 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 this society is about. And photography certainly gave me that language. You know, gave me that vocabulary. I believe um, to to try and see, you know, what it means. And I will also show you some of my work where I feel I'm trying to constantly understand how I can communicate this. And when I, when I showed my work, which is sort of very private in a, in a public, public platform, sometimes you can't really predict, right? Like what happens when you show the work. And, uh, and there were all kinds of reactions, but there were a lot of women who would sort of come to me and say, you know, like how they could find their experience in the work. Um, and I think sometimes when you, uh, when you, when you tell these stories, um, you know, of course it has a lot of challenges, you know, you're sort of putting yourself out there and people say, oh, so brave and stuff, but you're also making yourself quite uh, vulnerable because you know how much of you are you willing to put, put out. And I still sort of struggle, uh, with, with, with that idea. And my work also looks at my relationship with my mother, you know, even if I have her consent, where you know the letter she had written to me uh, about her dissatisfaction you know my mom is is from a certain generation of women you know she's never questioned anything and for her to see me questioning every other thing and putting everything out in public display even if her consent was there this and consent is also not sort of you know like black and white it becomes it's, it's quite murky in, in its own way uh, so uh, so uh, I, 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 I still sort of try and try to understand, you know, the medium, uh, how I'm uh, trying to communicate and try and listen to other people. Uh, of course, when you put out, a, out a, a, your personal story, there are a lot of things that you hear, but I, I also try and uh, stick to things uh, that sort of, uh, you know, is, is doing, the, the work is doing something to someone and, and that sort of pushes me to do, do my work. And I am uh, going to share. And my work, I always work uh, very, very intuitively. I'm always try very curious, uh, you know, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? What kind of meaning, uh, you know, does it become? And so I, I'm constantly uh, sort of uh, sharing. Uh, so, yeah. So I will quickly uh, go through through my work. Uh, this was uh, uh, the work I did way back in 2012. I thought uh, I was told that there'll be a lot of students today, so I thought it's uh, important that I also share my journey because work also takes time, you know, and uh, sometimes a lot of time. So this was something I had experimented when I was just uh, just learning photography. And then I got uh, inside my sort of domestic space and trying to figure out, you know, because there was something that I was sort of going through and trying to express. So I was just experimenting uh, some, uh, I don't know what I was thinking when I was doing this, but still I think in a way this, this sort of work and then working with 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 somebody else she was a widow and you know um and uh, how uh, you can sort of see i saw a lot in my family of how married women looked like and uh, and and this is also the time when i started thinking about color red in a way you know and if you have been to Kathmandu, you will realize you see a lot of red you know women wearing a lot of red when they go out so I thought red is an interesting color to work with because it, you know, it, it is about fertility, it is about auspiciousness. Red is color of menstrual blood, blood that is considered impure, you know. So all these things sort of, I started me connecting these dots and trying to experiment and see how I can work around it. And 
of course there was this this time that came where i would just be constantly hounded by these questions about you know why aren't you married this that and so that was also sort of um, you know what drove me to 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 my work and finally uh, a confrontation happened uh, you know i think it sort of took shape in 2017 onwards so i've been where i use a lot of gender markers of a married woman to talk about what it means to be a woman what it means to be in this body you know the body that carries all these experiences you've had over the period of time um, uh, so this is how it took shape and while i was working with red you know the idea of white sort of came into you know i started thinking about white uh, about being color being pure you know and how women are supposed to be pure so i started uh, you know experimenting with uh, with this color and then red and white about you know pure uh, impure so so basically i would try you know everything uh, that i can think of while i am uh, working on this uh, this space at one point i was also thinking you know should i should i be talking about these issues in a very metaphorical manner so what if i go around taking just pictures of red that i see so this sort of has been uh, has been my 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 process and this is how i i work so uh, yeah i think uh, this is what mostly my work is about so i'll leave it to the questions i believe am i uh thank you so much bunu and for showing us your beautiful photographs uh we have a few questions that have come in now uh so mansi i'll just start with you um there's someone who wants to know why you called the title of your series don't call me auntie if there's any reason why you refer to them as auntie and also if you shared these images with her and what her reaction was yeah the reason i named it um, because auntie would keep saying that don't call me auntie and uh, and, and everybody in the house used to call each other didi so all of them were didi uh, the little ones used to call me didi i used to call auntie didi the didi used to call other person didi so so yeah and she would keep telling sabzi wala everybody don't call me auntie don't call me auntie and and then earlier i had named the folder auntie and then something strike and i said okay i want to call it don't call me auntie and uh, yes i did share some images with her and uh, she was very very much conscious of that i i used to photograph her and later on she also photograph started photographing me and also with her own phone camera she used to take lots of images which is there and uh, but yes of course i didn't show picture of her back because like that was uh, I, yeah i was and i think that uh, yeah i mean there's no reason or right? because i was uh, i was scared and uh, and i didn't yeah and now i feel that it's silly uh, yeah and that's it that's it and i i did share images with her and one of the reason when uh yeah so that's it yeah that's what i wanted to say yeah the next question is for dolly how do we as anthropologists recontextualize our images beyond the violence to a form of healing if at all Uh, Dolly, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. Images are images, right? And and how do we contextualize images? It's pretty much what you're seeing now. How both our amazing panelists, photographers, and are contextualizing through words, language, through their position positionality as female. The, the positions that they have taken, the interactions with the society around them. So, if you're taking a, taking an image, you're already in a position at a particular location, at a particular history, under a particular circumstances to be doing that. So, you have two choices there: looking at the image and your own role in taking that image and in shaping a story. And what is what is that story that you want to tell? 
violence is real, so is healing and reconciliation. That's something that we learn. So how is it, perhaps, I will throw it out then to the audience, how is it that we process an image and we look at it? And the image, in the case of the Nagas, my people, and uh, uh, an image taken 120 years ago, today, is perhaps taken up by a young photographer again to recontextualize it. I'll tell you the story of Zubani Lota, who is a photographer from Nagala. She took an image, one image, of a Naga woman who was photographed by force, bare-chested. She traced the image to a family in a Naga village. And through that image came the story of humiliation and how British ethnographers actually would force people to strip and take that photo. An image is an image, and what do we do with it? Perhaps it's a journey. It takes a lifetime of both interacting and processing it. So of course, an image is there and violence is there, but I like your question about hope. So perhaps it's a journey that we'll all take together. The next question is for Bunu. You talked a lot about the importance of color in your work. So the audience wants to hear your thoughts on black and white photography. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm the right right person to you know, talk about uh, black and white photography as much. Uh, a lot of people think color is too distracting, you know, color demands too much attention and it takes away the emotions and sort of black and white, you know, you strip everything off, you know, the colors are off, hence um, it is believed that, you know, the, they have sort of probably black and white as the medium has more uh, more right over, uh, you know, talking about these sort of feelings and emotions. And uh, I wish I could take black and white photos. I can't. Um, I, I, I see the world, uh, you know, in color. I, I am extremely jealous of people who, uh, you know, shoot in black and white. Uh, I wish I had that kind of eye. Uh, but I don't. Uh, so I don't know if I am the right person, you know, uh, to... Maybe if I experiment, I would be able to tell you more about it. But um, but white is there, so I don't know. I don't know if this answers your question. But I think it's also about what you want to do. You know what? How, what you want to say about uh, with your work and this idea of black and white versus color, digital versus film. It can go on and on. I think. Uh, I think it's important to talk about, you know, what works for you? What is it that you want to tell? And how do you want to tell it? What is the story that you're trying to say? I think? Uh, the next questions are for Mansi. Uh, people want to know some more context about the project and what made you interested to go and live with the auntie. And also, since we're talking about consent, uh, what do you feel about taking an image of her back and not showing it to her? Was she aware that she was being photographed and that you're now sharing that work with an audience? And if not, do you think it's okay? And what makes that okay? Um, okay, so I'll start with the first question. Um, so I landed up, auntie was with my, uh, we were in the same dance class and in Mundi house. So that's how we met and I started to live with her. And uh, initially, I was very, very scared because um, auntie used to talk to herself and I was, what, eight, I was 18 at that time. And uh, <laughs> I thought, like, I used to feel that she would kill me. I'm living with this woman who would kill me, but the rent was so low that I, I had no choice but to live with her. And then I used to latch my door at night and I used to peep from the window, from my bedroom window to her, to her drawing room, if like, you know, she's not standing with knife. And from there to moving, you know, taking a journey with her where we used to go out for movies, you know, and uh, we used to party, we used to uh, get drunk, dance, uh, call my friends at home. So I think the, my camera, also became a way, it was a boundary in a way, initially, you know, that I don't want, I just want to take picture and that I, maybe I don't want to communicate more because you're a mad woman. Let me just 
to look have a look at you from a distance and and there were times of her she would also had bad mood swings and she would tell me just leave your you know i don't want to see you tomorrow just leave take your bags and leave and then i i would not show my camera for almost a month and i would like almost like be this girl and then slowly so like it's almost like sensing but somehow i and now when i think of it maybe if if i was this person who i am now i might have had more conversations with aunty you know i might have even recorded her voice i would have sang with her i would have i mean i did that but i would have i later like after her death i start writing about her you know and which i am planning to add i don't know um, what is going to be the final shape of the project but i started to write uh, look at my old notes so it's it's keep coming back to me in many forms um, and also another aspect i i recently discovered is about the life of kamlesh and her three daughters because in bengali market people are not familiar what happens in the back lanes everybody come to eat and have you know have parties and festivals but nobody knows what happens in the back lanes where it's it, it is meant for servant quarter and i was also part of a servant quarter so and and it's a very different life from the uh, from the front and the back so i think that's one aspect i want to add uh, to my work and uh, yes i didn't i didn't know that time when she i mean i was taking her picture of the back but i also feel that the reason why i showed it today here is because i feel that looking at that picture you don't show you don't see her you show you see me you know you see me you i it reveals my um, who who i was at that point when i was capturing the photo and uh, so it doesn't bother me right now um and also i i wanted to bring it out so that this question comes and there's something i also discovered yeah so i just wanted to say and and for me i i feel that photography is something which is is part of my life which is also kind of uh transforming me you know as it's transforming in itself as a form it's transforming me as a person it's all co it's codependent uh so dolly the next few questions are for you how does sure. how do anthropological subjects from northeast india respond to their portrayal how respond to their old portrayal of themselves at dioramas of the public day parade or the images that circulate in the media um connected to this is you spoke of the gaze in a colonial context so when photographers are documenting the intimate lives of others how would you contextualize the gaze then uh, are these two gazes different or the same okay so I'll, so i'll try to answer what i understood okay um in in terms of in terms of okay so i'll just stick to the gaze right i'll just stick to the gaze and about um one of the ways that i see uh my work and that that locates me i think uh that 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 helps me that helps me to think okay all right so one of the ways in which i think i assess uh any work one like i say i think is it collaborative right is it collaborative what are the hierarchies who is telling the story um and how are we picturing this secondly i think in terms of um photography and what was that a corona was it around republic day was it about republic I, day pictures being taken yes it was about representations in dioramas in republic day okay so so when we think about perhaps capturing images one is that intimate interaction that, that we are talking about the other one is also the performative element of it so looking at republic day looking at looking at functions uh, even the hornbill festival is a good example in nagaland where a lot of people go to absorb a particular kind of culture that is being shown but if you ask the dancers i wrote that in 2009 um a, a thing uh in terms of uh, looking at you know uh including the naked nagas that's what i titled my chapter so if we look at 
a lot of the performances happening during the hornbill where you go and you shoot and you know you think that that's Naga culture. Who am I to say what is Naga culture or not Naga culture? But you talk to the, I would encourage you all to go and talk to the dancers, to the performers. A lot of them belong to clubs. They belong to cultural associations who are coming there to perform because they need a livelihood and they're ready to perform and which should be fine, right? If it's a dance, if we are actually transitioning from looking at culture in terms of everyday practice into a performance where people are standing and posing, I think for us as consumers and as photographers, we have to very consciously know the depth of the difference and what we are capturing. That's what I would say. Um, Karuna, is, is it possible for me to screen share for like a minute? Some, I think some of the sure, um, yeah, audiences yeah. are, yeah, they yeah. want to see the photo. Yeah, you, 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 know. you have access to screen share, you can do that. Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll try to do, um, I think I'll try to do screen share uh, and I'll, so can, can you all see my screen? screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, so this is, these are the dolls from 2014. I was doing field work and all, and you know, uh, around, so you can see February 25th, so around like International Women's Day. And they were preparing that for, for uh, fundraising for survivors of uh, thing, uh, sexual violence. This is from my PhD field work. Uh, it's, 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 it's in my book, uh, Living with Oil and Coal. I was looking at militarization extraction in the Northeast. And for some reason, this is a school and the kids really drew my attention. And I constantly went back to the school. So the school and the story of the school is in the conclusion of my book. And, and, and you know, the children here, I, I would sit in the afternoon and look at the children and they inspired me to actually shape my concept of the future, the carbon future, right? And, and what we are looking at. Um, the other picture that I have very quickly is this, of the women's police station. So like I said, I started taking photos of really like maybe even a pond spit or you know the staircase and the darkness going into it, no electricity and what was happening. Um, this, is, this is a picture that I took and I really like her. I mean, she's not even aware of the camera and she's looking at her fermented soya beans. It's known as akuni. And I was working on my food ethnography and I ended up writing an article called Fermenting Modernity. And it became a chapter in the uh, Cambridge Compendium on uh, Contemporary Food in India. And I just love this gaze that she's, I mean, it's her work and she just, she's just loving that moment. So I thought I'll present this. The, the other image I have is this, this one. And this is a oil rig in the foothills of Nagaland. So, you know, the Naga people protested against the mining in Nagaland that ONGC was doing. And around 1993, 94, they left the Naga Naga areas in terms of extracting oil. And these are the remnants and some of the oil valves are still leaking. So this was once again part of my PhD work that I was um, doing around 2009-10. And this is, a, this is something that I captured. If you look at it closely, you can see the cobwebs. And that's something that I found it extremely fascinating. How in an oily landscape, we find life, we find different kinds of species coming into it and then conquering that landscape again. This is a photograph from Mon. You must have heard of the Hornbill Festival. So the Hornbill Festival is a post ceasefire uh, initiative. And one of the initiative of the government of Nagaland was to do a series of road shows, right? In a way to show how cool the districts were and how cool the Nagas were and what we were doing with governance. This picture for me as an anthropologist captures a lot. I mean, you see the level of armed people around, but you see two Nagaland police. Right, who are Nagas themselves, desperate to learn and what the elder is doing. And this is one of the vanishing practices we have among the Nagas, and that's the culture and the art and the craft of gun making. So, so I think this, this says a lot, and particularly also the maker is actually in full costume. You wouldn't be working wearing a headgear like that, right? And so it says something a lot. And the red red waistcoat that's there, it's, it's the waistcoat of the Dobashis. The Dobashis are the interpreters, an office which colonial uh, Britishers created. This is also a part of my work on mining and extraction in the Northeast. And what do you see here? I crawl into one of the red hole mines and I found that the kids who are mining actually have candles, right? They don't even have torchlights. So they light candles inside those caves and they mine for coal. 
So this is a picture that I, I took inside and, you know, I have it, I have this picture or, or a similar picture in my book, but I, but it reminds me of the precarity and at the same time, really, the livelihood issues and the violence of mining and what we are doing to the landscape. This picture that I wanted to show you all is for my, from my current work on food and fermentation in the Himalayas. I just made a documentary and I should, be, I should be launching it soon on Zoom. So I ask all the audience who are here to please come and support and watch this 12 minute documentary. But this is, this is something that I took in the forest as I followed the women who, who are foragers and they, and they go to the foothills to collect bamboo shoots. So these are like fresh bamboo shoots uh, which will be taken back to the village to ferment it. So pretty much, I think that's the picture that I want, wanted to share with you all. So thank you for indulging me and uh, seeing some of my pictures, thank you. Thank you so much, Dolly, that was lovely. Uh, for Bunu, when we enter our private spaces with a camera and photograph our families, are we the photographer or are we still a part of the family? And how does our gaze change in this process? And how much of it is documentary or staged when we make the photographs and also how do you not end up internalizing these stories that you tell i think when we <clears throat> i think when we when we start uh, you know photographing our, our our ourselves and when we start telling our stories you know sometimes it becomes difficult to anyway i i find it difficult to place where i am you know who i am identity has always been sort of an issue for me you know uh, and uh, now that I turn the camera inwards and towards my family uh, I think it's there is there is this sort of you know back and forth between me being a photographer you know sometimes me being a photographer comes very prominently when I'm trying to take really good images you know and then I have to sort of sometimes say you know it's not about take you know, it's not about taking this like perfect uh, photo. And uh, with my mom, especially, uh, I also I also realized that how we don't have a photograph of just the two of us. You know, uh, it's it's either with the family or uh, there was there's just one or two photos of her and me when I was trying to look at my sort of family uh, photos. And uh, and then uh, for, for us coming from two different generations, there's a lot of conflict. Of course, there's love. There's definitely love. But there's just so, it's just, you know, the, the expectations uh, are just so, so there. And it's, you know, it's not easy. So I thought, what happens if we are in the same frame together? You know, what, how would we be? Uh, so it was sort of like I've uh, said it before. My uh, work has always been a process and trying to see, uh, understand, uh, feel. Uh, so it is, it's a lot. I, I think I, I, I fluctuate between, between the two, but, uh, but mostly I feel, you know, I feel actually, I also sometimes feel that, you know, outside of the camera, I'm performing a lot, you know, <laughs> and somehow camera actually gives me that space to, to be angry, gives me that space to, sort of talk about these frustrations in a way, you know. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, uh, we're going to go on to more general questions now. We had a lot of questions. So whatever you address to individual speakers will definitely be sent to them and we will get back to you. But now we want to touch upon the more general themes. Um, how do you address challenges stemming from your own positionality, whether that's gender, class, caste, etc.? And how does this affect the trust you enjoy or don't while picturing people? When does the line cross from being appreciation to appropriation? And how does this work in journalism? And where exactly do you stop documenting? Uh, any one of you can answer this question. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So, okay. I, it was a very, very long question. So <laughs> I understood only the last part. So, um, so talking about journalism, um, when, 
when is the time you stop photographing is i think it's yeah it's it's there is no there is no specific i, I think it's a constant constant uh, sensing process you know it's you sense how the other the other person is where the other person is how uh, even sometimes you're at risk yourself so you have to uh, see what position you have to take at that uh, point then uh, you know so i feel there is no exact answer to this i think you're constantly uh, sensing your environment and and that's what bruno all said it's very intuitive you have to be very intuitive when you're out there you with your camera because yeah the, the boundary can be easily crossed um so so if i can uh, very quickly come on that about i think the as an anthropologist you know as as somebody who is really looking at at the image now at this late stage of my life playing with images and being being a student all over again um i'm i'm overwhelmed with the sharp and amazingly insightful questions that are coming on the chat and i'm sorry i have to disappoint you because i'm i'm totally like uh, humbled by the depth of engagement that people are having on this zuban platform but in my own way let me in a very shallow way answer when it come to when it comes to positionality in terms of i think myself both as a photographer as an anthropologist uh, it it is it is something very intimate and private because these are my eyes right i'm using a machine i'm using my eyes i'm using my thought at that moment to capture that image so surely positionality of what matters and what i'm taking really is structured and it's it's captured at that moment when does it go from appropriate uh, from appreciation to appropriation a very valid important question because when it comes to appropriation we constantly talk about how we appropriate certain spaces and what is it that we do and once again let me go back to the point that i made about collaboration so you as a photographer you as the image taker as a researcher as a thinker will know right what matters is the intent yeah? <laughs> will know whether you are there in that space to appropriate a story to make it your own or to collaborate and how do you see that happening and i think this is both a very personal and a deeply deeply ethical issue right there because when it comes to appropriation indigenous communities across the world including australia don't forget i'm speaking from melbourne right where we constantly talk about appropriation whether appropriating positions why only image Right? Look at all the diversity positions. You have white people heading that. Isn't that appropriation? <laughs> right? You look at look at the look at the uh, thing uh, affirmative action positions, whether in the United States or others. Right? Who sits at the top and who appropriates those voices? So I think if you're looking at images and then we go into the concept and think about appreciation and appropriation. I think there we go into I think a large issue of ethics, and I think it's a very very appropriate theme that we are beginning to think about it. How do we appreciate, and how do we, in a sense, introspect about appropriate? Um, and so I think that's that's where I'll I'll stop. Um, how is someone? Uh, so before I go on to the next question, I know it's beyond five. We're going to be extending the session for about ten to fifteen minutes because there are so many questions. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, Karuna, you're not. Being <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so how is someone who is not from a particular community? Um, So for the act of photography should it be limited to people who are in that community itself and what are things to be considered when you are photographing people who are not from the same community as you uh, and is it possible to stop the process of othering when you are taking a photograph since you are the one deciding the frame do you know would you like to answer this one sure but uh, um, you know in between i i i sometimes you know try and do work Uh, that are outside of me because i feel i've just been constantly looking inwards and you know when i go out there and i i feel uh, you know i i'm extremely aware of my my privilege 
you know uh, especially when i go to small uh, villages or towns you know where from where i come and how people sort of easily give you access to photograph and i feel sometimes extremely uncomfortable uh, and Uh, at times i have questioned myself again and again you know am i the right person to be telling this story uh, but then again you keep thinking who's the right person you know who dis- who, who who decides what what to tell and 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 sometimes uh, at least consciously you try and mo- not misrepresent something you know i think uh, that is um, very important but again it's it's a difficult uh, difficult space to be in i'm uh i'm in awe of journalist every time you know when good they go out and do these very difficult stories um, uh, maybe mansi would be able to answer it more uh, with her experience as opposed to mine but i'm 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 aware of my where i come from when i go uh mansi would you like to um yeah this Yeah, of course i mean i find it uh, somehow i yeah and i think this this understanding of uh, not trying to other other uh, do othering is uh, is something which i think i have it has come from just learning you know uh, understanding and understanding more you know i i won't say that it was there always but it's something uh, because you know when when i i remember when i started my uh, journey with photojournalism um, my focus was more on the story you know and not primarily on the subjects and how i'm interacting and i might have crossed the boundaries but i think more and more when i give a thought a thought to it and it's uh, the process the process start itself started to change and uh, yes i mean there are but yeah i i don't know i mean i just there are difficult questions because you know sometimes when i think that this like picture of my little brother i have shot crying and if he comes to me after 10 years and tells me that mansi i hate you for taking that picture i wish you had not taken that picture of me i don't know what i'm going to say i I I just say sorry I'll say sorry that I didn't I will tell my intention what I meant to do but so these are the question I am also dealing with you know and as a as a craft as a working with the image because it stays you know it's permanent and that's the challenge um so I think somewhere then for example like uh, adding adding text to it adding t- changing the narrative sometimes can you know change the meaning of the image you know that's how uh, it's important for a photographer to keep going back to his or her work and not necessary that it has to come to an end you know even if somebody has made a book so that's not the end of it you know one can always keep revisiting and uh, yeah seeing it in many different forms i want to Okay uh so this is the last question for now everyone's questions have been noted and we will forward them um on to the person you address them to and we will definitely get back to you with the response uh so the question is is background and context understanding imperative before embarking on a particular project and also is it okay if we make images that talk about stories of oppression that come through lived experience and not necessarily subvert it is it important to subvert through photography so sub <laughs> you have a very intelligent audience for us now but i'm really i think i feel i'm so back in college <laughs> i know this is such a wonderful panel and you know i mean i'm <laughs> can we can we subvert look at me i'm 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 wearing a necktie and in in this moment i'm al- already subverting right who the naga head hunters are for you so in that image in a moment what do we do what do we capture i'm constantly subverting in my writing because i refuse to write about a particular narrative of my people or the feminist community that i belong to 
I'm writing about food right now. That's my current book. What am I doing in my food book? I'm, I'm adopting the lens of gender and human rights and of militarization because food that we eat is not only about joy, especially when it comes to food and consumption in India with caste, with Dalits and tribals. We don't even get houses to stay in places like Delhi because of the food that we eat. Right? So surely in the narrative that we have, in our experiences that we have, by turning the lens, we subvert. And it's the same with photography. And it's the same with my image and with, with, this, with this physical corporeal body that I'm here, right, with you all. Perhaps some people will be very upset that I'm not wearing a Nava shawl. And I have immense respect for all the shawls. It's fine. I'm doing something else, perhaps. And this is how I'm presenting myself right now at this moment at 9.40 PM Melbourne time to you all. So in terms of perhaps, I think the subversion that we have and what do we do with it, I think it's really important. Karuna, that's my short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dolly. Yeah, Bunu, Mansi, would you like to? Uh, wow. <laughs> I'm still trying to remember the question. I don't know if I, I, I understood the question correctly. But I think when I'm, uh, you know, uh, using a camera, pointing camera towards me, using these very gendered um, objects used uh, by married women to sort of question, I think I'm subverting in a way, right? So um, what was the other thing? Sorry, I just got caught up with the word. But uh, yeah, so uh, is it okay if we make images that talk about stories of oppression that come from lived experience and not necessarily subvert it and is subversion important through photography i think uh, I, I would i would like to uh, go back to my earlier point you know what is it that you want to tell i think uh, as as a storyteller we know what is it um, what is okay what is not okay maybe something is okay for me and uh, might not be okay for someone else you know but your intention, like uh, Dolly also talked about, you know, what is your intention and what are you trying to say? Something I think, if you are aware of it, it helps. But at the same time, uh, I also believe a lot because I work very intuitively at the same time. I also believe that you should let, um, you know, let chance sort of come in and explore as you go along. But then again, depends on who you're photographing. You know, where are you going? As whom? And there are a lot of these questions, but I think it always helps to know what you want. And even if you don't, to sort of go and see what you get, I guess. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mansi, would you like to contribute? No, no, I think. <laughs> uh, all right, then. Um, I think that's all for now. Thank you for, there were so many lovely questions and I'm sure our speakers also loved answering them. Uh, that's all for now. Thank you for all of you who are here for participating. And a big thank you to our speakers, Bunu, Dolly, and Mansi. Our thank next you. session in this series is titled Theory and Practice, Informing Photographic Practices with Feminist and Queer Theories, which is happening next Friday, 22nd May at 4 p.m. You can register the same way that you registered for this one. If you wish to watch our previous sessions on a crisis of care, feminist perspectives on the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown in India, you can go to our YouTube page, which will be in the chat box below. Uh, please make sure you're following us on social media so you stay up to date of any events you might be having in the future. Uh, have a good weekend and goodbye, everyone.